Okay, so it gives me absolute great pleasure to introduce Professor Yelena Vukovic, who is a professor at Stanford, um, where she leads the nanoscale and quantum photonics lab. She is also the director of QFARM, the Stanford Slack Quantum Initiative. Vukovic has won numerous awards, including the IETAF Harvey Prize, James P. Gordon Memorial Speakership from the OSA, Humboldt Prize, the Distinguished Scholar Award from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, Hans Fischer Senior Fellowship, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and the Young Investigator Awards from DARPA and the Office of Naval Research. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society, of the Optical Society of America, and of the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers. So um, please, whenever you're ready, we, we're so grateful for you being here today. Thank you very much, Judy, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak uh, here um, to you. And uh, hopefully, not too far in the future, I could also visit in person. Um, uh, I will talk today about our work on um, scalable photonics. I mean, this kind of this title, Scalable Photonics and Optimized Approach, um, summarizes um, everything that my group does, but I will cover both kind of classical photonics side of our work as well as some of the quantum optics side of the work, uh, which I assume would mm, kind of cover broader interests of the, of the, the community. And I don't really need to, to explain this to you uh, since you are optics experts, but you know that optics and photonics have many applications. Um, and here are some of the, the interesting ones that people are working on today, which range from optical interconnects for data centers, optical computing, optical neural networks, quantum technologies, augmented reality, glasses, uh, LiDAR systems, variety of sensors, and also biosensors. Uh, but of course, for pretty much all of these applications, um, you can't really use free space optic solutions because of the very large footprint. So you have to think about integrated photonic solutions. Um, for example, for augmented reality glasses, you have to fit everything into a footprint of regular glasses. So how do you do that? Um, and of course, we, we have uh, integrated photonics as in a very active field of research for, for decades. Um, and here are some of the examples of beautiful integrated photonic structures in, in silicon or insulator. But as we all know, integrated photonics uh, is um, uh, pretty bulky. Right? Optical components occupy a lot of footprint on the chip, much more than electronic devices. So you, for example, have these WDM devices, filters that occupy tens of micrometers per component. Uh, then also uh, all of these structures tend to be very sensitive to fabrication, temperature errors, which is why people integrate post-tuning elements, heaters like this one here, in order to tune them on resonance post-fabrication or if the temperature changes, for example, as a result of, of electronics operating nearby next to photonics or any changes in the environment. And then also people design these devices by manual tuning of few design parameters. Um, they change, for example, this diameter of the, the ring, or they change distance to control coupling, really few parameters in the geometry in order to control, to, to control the, the target operation. But the fact that uh, people are generally starting from the library of known devices and then just tuning few parameters means that um, um, there is no reason to believe that any of these devices are actually optimal geometry. And also, um, there is a very limited number of functionalities uh, for the optical devices that we have today. And those are generally the ones that people have used in the past, uh, the ones that are inherited from microwave engineering or developed over the past decades in, in optoelectronics. Uh, but for building some completely new photonic systems, often you come up with some new functionalities. And for that, we don't really have off-the-shelf devices, as I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, and finally, as a result of, of the fact that we don't really design uh, these optical structures in, a, in an optimal way, um, there are many optical devices, even in practical systems, that are not very efficient. For example, grading couplers in commercial photonic systems often don't have efficiency that exceeds 40%, which means you throw away most of your power at the input to your photonic chip. Um, also, you know, as a result of this tuning, you also increase energy consumption in the system because you integrate all of these heaters and other tuning elements. And um, even um, uh, other structures like modulators and so on don't operate at the optimal condition. So you build, for example, some optical interconnect system and you end up operating uh, with the energy per bit that is on the order of picojoule per one transmitted bit, which is what people can also achieve today with electronics. So, you know, going into photonics, but not really 
being able to get to higher speed simultaneously with lower energy per bit kind of beats the purpose of using photonics in some of these applications, such as in Jeconex. So how do we overcome all of these problems? And how do we come up with better device, device designs or, or new functionalities or compact footprints? Um, how do we, um, can, how, how can we design some, some optical device for a particular function um, and even new functionalities without just tweaking some of the elements that we learned about in our optics classes? And finally, can we even make um, photonics accessible to electronic circuit designers? Uh, so that they don't really have to have a PhD in our field in order to design photonic elements for their optoelectronic circuit. And this is something that we've been wondering uh, about for a really long time and, and working on in my group for about 15 years or so. Uh, but um, eight years ago, we finally managed to divide, design optical devices by searching a full parameter space in three dimensions. So this is like really fully optimal design for a particular target function. And we call this method inverse design because we start from what we would like to be um, the operating condition for the device and efficiency and mapping between input and output. And then we search the full parameter space of fabricable devices in three dimensions to design something that works. And in that process, you end up with structures that are very non-intuitive, like the one shown here, which is the same as the one behind me. This is a real device made in silicon. But I'll show you in a moment that uh, all these structures kind of beat the state of the art photonic devices in terms of many figures of merit. Smaller footprint, higher efficiency, um, robustness to errors in fabrication or environment, uh, more energy efficient and so on. Uh, so as I, as I said, this process is what we call inverse design in photonics and with Alejandro Rodriguez from Princeton, we wrote a review article a couple of years ago. If you're new to the field, we here covered all of the great activities in this field of inverse design um, in, in photonics and applications to variety of, of directions in photonics. So what are we doing really? Um, so we start from the desired behavior of the photonic device and then search the full parameter space. But parameter space in three dimensions is enormous, right? So you can't really search it, pre perform some blindfolded search. Instead, you have to do physics guided search. And that's, mm, that's where we apply variety of optimization techniques coupled with fast electromagnetic solvers. So that's uh, basically the process. And I'll just show you the movie of how, for example, the design of a mode converter looks like. So here we're converting first order mode to second order mode from input to output. And you see the design process and the corresponding electromagnetic field on the right hand side. Um, so that's the first stage of optimization. The second stage of optimization where you basically produce something that you can make binary optimization and incorporate constraints, fabrication constraints. So this is just kind of changing uh, between refractive index of, in this case, silicon and air. And at the end, you stop when you reach target efficiency, which here was 90%, and you really map first to second order mode at the output. And I should uh, emphasize that this is fully three-dimensional. Here you see only two-dimensional image, which is a cross-section of the device, but the optimization is completely done in three dimensions. And we constrain the geometry to a single pattern in one planar layer, because that's something that we can easily fabricate. And of course, for in-plane planar photonics, that's what we pre prefer to do. At most, we, we go to maybe a couple of layers. But you know, since you're using three-dimensional optimization, you can design something with arbitrary patterns in three dimensions. Uh, and if you can fabricate it, that of course, gives you even more degrees of freedom. And design of a three-dimensional device uh, of this size, which is a uh, two by one microns in, in footprint roughly, um, uh, takes about 400 iterations and you do um, solve problems twice in each iteration. So you, you run about 800 electromagnetic simulations and that takes on gaming GPUs about one hour. So that's telling you that we had to develop also fast electromagnetic solvers. In order to do that, we don't really rely on any commercial electromagnetic solvers because one single uh, simulation on something like Lumerical or, or Comsol would take much longer than fraction of a second that, that we do here. So we, we have our own fast electromagnetic solver and we have also, also our fast electromagnetic uh, optimization tools. And as a result, again, you stop not just when you design something that does mode conversion, but you, you just search for a solution that does it with a particular efficiency that's incorporated here and also robustness to fabrication errors and minimum feature sizes. So here we stopped when we got the solution that has 90% efficiency. 
Um, but of course, you can set up that number to whatever you desire. And for those of you who are familiar with how we do mode conversion traditionally in photonics, this footprint is orders of magnitude smaller than adiabatic mode converter, where you slowly expand the waveguide, and that's how you would convert from first order, second order mode. This is only about two microns by one micron, and adiabatic mode converter would be hundreds of microns for 90% efficiency. So that's um, one example. And here is, for example, another, uh, here is another example where you are making a WDM device, wavelength splitter. You want to split, let's say, 1.3 from 1.5 microns. Uh, on the right, you see how the optimization process looks like. Um, you are, um, again, searching through this enormous parameter space uh, using some, some, some type of gradient descent process until you, you find the uh, solution that works, again, with the right efficiency and with the right mapping of input to output modes. And what is very interesting here is that the footprint in which we work is 2.8 by 2.8 microns. Um, and this is in silicon on insulator layer. Um, and in this small footprint, which is, again, much smaller than typical WDM devices that are 10 micron rings or, or larger, you can, we can find for that particular efficiency and for uh, that particular level of robustness to the environment uh, about six solutions, which is actually telling you how suboptimal um, structures are that we're working on um, today in traditional photonics when you can shrink the footprint by at least an order of magnitude and find six equally good solutions that satisfy your problem. So that is one solution. And then you know, if you initialize it differently, you end up with a different solution. This is a different solution for the same problem in the same footprint. And we decided to make this one. Uh, so that's the design. Um, again, three-dimensional design in the layer of silicon on insulator. Here is the fabricated structure in uh, silicon on insulator. Um, and going from the design to fabrication is actually pretty simple in a university lab, because as a result of the design process, you obtain your GDS file, which is giving you a layout of your uh, the electric constant. And you send that directly to electron beam writer. And that defines the pattern for your electron beam writer. But later in the talk, I'll show you how do you do the same thing using tape outs in commercial foundries. So here are fabricated WDM devices. Again, this is splitting 1.3 from 1.5 microns. Um, and uh, here is the, the layout of that device superimposed with the fields at 1.3 and 1.5 microns. And we designed this one to be broadband. So as you are scanning input wavelength, as you see here in 100 nanometer range around 1.3, you transmit to the top port and then you transmit to the bottom port uh, in 100 nanometer range around 1.5. And when you measure uh, the fabricated devices, you obtain um, really predicted uh, transmission behavior. So these are experimental results shown in the plot uh, on, on top right. And I mentioned here that the reason why these lines look thicker um, is not because there's are error bars, but simply because we measure transmission for all of the devices on the chip fabricated with this set of parameters and superimpose the plots, just plotting them on top of each other. And they all line up on top of each other pretty much. And that's really uh, great um, to see because our fabrication is not perfect but our structures, uh, functional devices have much higher yield and this is without any post tuning. So these are fully passive devices without any post fabrication tuning and they all basically work because we incorporate fabrication errors, typical fabrication errors as constraints into the optimization. So beyond that initial work, we expanded you know, these WDM devices, for example, to three channel splitters like the one shown here. So this is about four by five microns for uh, splitting three wavelengths in uh, 1550 band. And these are the experimental results, again, plotted for many devices on the chip and they all line up together. And um, you can extend this to even larger number of channels, uh, uh, but these are the ones that we worked on uh, initially. Um, and um, Working on this problem for, for 15 years or so, we've developed software suite, which we call Stanford Photonics Inverse Design Software, or SPINS, uh, which now uh, some major factories, uh, major photonics companies are using, and also government labs and academic groups. Um, and it's available for licensing from Stanford um, if, if anybody is interested. But we also have the basic version of the same software, which is open sourced online. Uh, and we call it SPINS-B, and you can download it from GitHub. 
And this has a lot of interesting features, not the full uh, capability of uh, the full spins, but it has electromagnetic solver and optimization uh, routines. And a lot of also researchers are playing with the open source version. So now, uh, you know, since mm, we, we've been using this for a long time, I'll kind of go through some set of interesting examples that we managed to, uh, to uh, address with, with the inverse design. I covered already WDM devices, and these are problems where you already have solutions in traditional photonics, but you are solving the same problem in smaller footprint, and you are solving it in such a way that it is more efficient or more robust to the environment and so on. Um, but also there are problems where you don't have a solution in traditional photonics. And I'll cover two examples uh, that we recently solved using inverse design. One is um, on-chip laser driven particle accelerator structure. And the other is non-reciprocal pulse router um, in silicon, which we, also, which we also solved. And finally, I'd like to mention that uh, this process is fully compatible with foundry-based fabrication. Uh, and uh, I'll cover also some of our work. Uh, on that, but so far we've worked with pretty much all of the major foundries, global foundries, AIM Photonics, um, IME, and uh, the process works beautifully um, with, with all of them. And all, the, all of these examples uh, here are silicon on insulator. Uh, of course, the inverse design process is agnostic relative to the material that you are um, employing. You just need to know parameters of that material and fabrication constraints. So for example, in my group, we worked actively in with the diamond and silicon carbide as well uh, in the context of inverse design. And more recently, we worked with um, uh, collaborators on lithium nibate, tantala, but you can work with any material of your choice. You only need to know um, your fabrication constraints and also material parameters. So now let me cover uh, foundry-based fabrication. Um, foundry-based fabrication is basically the same as uh, fabrication in a university facility, but of course it's very important to prove that your process works in a foundry. Um, otherwise, you cannot really um, perform um, high throughput fabrication for uh, some commercial applications. And uh, in this process, uh, what we do is we still design the device the same way, but we use fabrication constraints for a particular foundry process. And these constraints are foundry dependent and, and different from our electron beam or our university facility fabrication in terms of minimum feature sizes and so on. But that's certainly something that you, you can obtain uh, as a founder user, and then you redesign your, those devices with those constraints in mind. And once you obtain your device design, you can actually perform design rule check, make sure that all of the foundry design rules are satisfied, and then uh, foundry can perform fabrication. And the first uh, successful uh, devices, photonic devices, uh, uh, were fabricated using inverse design in AIM Photonics. This was our work in collaboration with John Bowers from UC Santa Barbara. Um, and we sent a variety of devices, some of which we made before, uh, had made before at Stanford using Libin lithography and some of the new devices. And we were very happy to, to see that they actually all, all worked. So here is one example, three channel, WDM device valent demultiplexer. This one here is the one made at Stanford. I already showed you results before. This is the same device made in AIM Photonics in silicon on insulator, exactly the same design. Uh, this is the pre predictive behavior for transmission as a function of wavelength. And here is the measure behavior for foundry devices. Again, we, we plot transmission for many devices on the trip that were made with the same parameters and they line up on top of each other. And um, if you compare it with the theoretically predicted behavior, there um, actually correspondence is pretty good. There is a minor discrepancy, which comes from the fact that when we send these first devices for tape out, uh, we send them with minimum feature sizes of 80 nanometers, but it turns out that for AIM photonics, minimum features are more like 100 nanometers. Um, and this is another example, which is spatial mode splitter converter, uh, where you have the first order mode, which you split into one port. Second order mode is converted to first order mode and split to a different port. This is in a small footprint, 2.8 by 2.8 microns, silicon on insulator. Um, minimum feature sizes, again, this was designed with 80 nanometers. Um, we made cascade of two of those in, in photonics. Uh, here is a theoretically predicted behavior for cascade of two devices. Uh, theoretically, we predict 2 dB loss for cascaded two devices in 300 nanometer bandwidth. And then um, 
when we uh, received trips from the tape out and measured, we saw three dB loss total. So one, one and a half dB per device. And again, the discrepancy comes from the fact that minimum features in a foundry were about 100 nanometers and not 80 nanometers the way we designed. But nevertheless, I mean, this is still an excellent performance and a very useful device that you could use to capture two input modes or, or two polarizations. Um, and since then, we worked with a variety of other foundries. This is with, uh, with the work with IME, for example, but we've also worked actively with global foundries uh, in collaboration with Firuza Flatuni from UPenn um, and also John Bowers. Uh, here, uh, we uh, de designed and implemented a mode uh, division multiplexing and demultiplexing system employing inverse design. So inverse designed elements are in this rectangle labeled as two, um, and there is a little bit of the zoomed in uh, picture in the inset for multiplexer and the multiplexer is, is on the other end. And the distance is about 300 micrometers. Um, and here you can use these elements in order to increase the number of channels for communication in optical interconnects. So we still use wavelength division multiplexing and demultiplexing here, and you can see modulators and ring resonators, but then we feed four channels into one mode division multiplexing and demultiplexing multiplexing um, uh, uh, route, route, which means that you increase the number of channels by a factor of four. And um, here, of course, you have electronics, you have everything on the same chip. It all works really, really nicely. And we've recently collaborated with um, John Bowers and Alan Wilner on measurement of bit error rates and also high speed operation in this system. And we're very uh, excited actually about the results. But the measurements that you see here are low speed measurements we did at Stanford. And we have excellent channel crosstalk and um, uh, measured, of course, and uh, excellent uh, um, minimized input loss into the system. So, so this is already, you know, getting into um, uh, the level of more, much more complex optoelectronic opt and integrated photonic circuits than uh, relative to our initial work with, with simple elements done in a foundry. So now, you know, going into a uh, different um, functionality, I, I mentioned that, that one of the really points to emphasize here with inverse design is not just replacing traditional elements with kind of smaller and maybe more efficient elements, we, we can also design new functionalities. And uh, the other new functionality I'd like to emphasize is uh, this uh, non-reciprocal transmission and routing uh, element that we um, recently designed and demonstrated. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Andrea Lu from City University of New York. And you, we all know that, of course, um, uh, we uh, isolators or uh, are crucial elements for building integrated photonic circuits, uh, and they're very difficult to make in an integrated form. Um, but here we actually made an element, non-reciprocal transmission element that can um, that is not exactly an isolator, but for applications, for example, like ranging measurement. Um, that I'll show you in a moment. Um, it works really well in an integrated form and it replaces um, a, an isolator. For, so it's really uh, dependent on a particular, the particular function. Uh, and for that one, it's, it works beautifully. So the idea here is from Andrea Lu's group um, and uh, very simple. I mean, he proposed and they also demonstrated in microwave circuit a few, few years ago that if you have a cascade of two resonators uh, with Lorentzian line shape and Fano resonator line shape, like the one on the right, uh, with control some precise phase delay between them, and Fano resonator has nonlinearity, this simple configuration could be used to achieve non-reciprocal transmission. Uh, and simply you achieve that by controlling coupling to the nonlinear final resonator. So if you design the system in such a way that in forward direction and backward direction, you couple different amount of power to this nonlinear resonator, that means that the transmission characteristics for this resonator would shift by a different amount for forward and for backward uh, propagating direction. So at the laser wavelength that you have, uh, which is fixed, you will have different transmission in forward and backward direction in a certain dynamic power range. And uh, this idea was demonstrated by Andra Lu's group in microwave, but to demonstrate it in optical uh, range, we didn't really have known elements that we could simply combine here. Uh, but of course, you know, we could rely on inverse design to design everything that is needed, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, so we started from a waveguide with two coupled resonators. Um, these are racetrack resonators in silicon. 
there is a waveguide. We rely here on kernel nonlinearity uh, in silicon, third order nonlinearity. And what we're actually uh, doing here using inverse design is we're basically just optimizing the coupling regions between a waveguide and a resonator by introducing these perturbations into the waveguide in such a way that we achieve desired transmission characteristics for the, for the Lorentzian resonator and Pano resonator. And these are very small elements. So this takes only a couple of hours, again, in three dimensions. And here you see how the optimization process looks like for, again, Pano resonance and Lorentzian resonance. It's just optimizing the coupling region. And, and when you reach uh, the target performance, which means particular transmission characteristics and efficiencies, you stop. And here is the result. Right, so it resulted measured transmission for final resonance and for Lorentzian resonance, and uh, with these inserted elements, and it all matches desired behavior. So when you go back and put everything together, you expect to see non-reciprocal transmission, meaning that in forward and backward direction, you are, you don't transmit uh, power in the same way. And um, uh, this doesn't really work exactly like an isolator. So if you have CW beam at the input and output, it will not really work. But if you have uh, pulses at the input and output in, in a particular operating range, it would work really nicely. And that's, that's actually shown here, where in the dynamic power range of operation of the system, you are basically transmitting forward propagating pulses, but backward propagating pulses are blocked in the yellow slots. And then here, uh, if you're outside of that dynamic power range, both forward and backward propagating pulses are, are, prop are basically transmitted through the system. And we've shown that this also works at 10 gigahertz rate, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, not a problem to actually perform this at, at high speeds as, as shown in this inset, where again, you're blocking backward propagating pulses at, at 10 gigahertz speed. So where would you use something like that? Uh, uh, our uh, application of interest was ranging measurements. And of course you can do optical ranging measurements using off the chip circulators and switches, but they're expensive and, and uh, consume uh, energy, um, a, lot of, a lot of power and also oper occupy a lot of footprint. So we uh, can use these simple blocks consisting of two, two resonators on the silicon chip uh, as basically circulator and switch uh, that we could use uh, in the ranging measurements. And in the ranging measurements, you're sending pulses from laser to some target. Uh, of course, this would be useful for, for LiDAR, for example, uh, and then reflecting them from a target. And based on the delay between uh, forward and backward propagating pulses, you are estimating distance to the target. And of course, these back reflected pulses cannot go into a laser. You would like to block them from going through a laser. So you would need a circulator or isolator to do that. But instead of doing that with an off chip element, we can do that with this simple non reciprocal uh, element that contains two resonators. And uh, that non reciprocal element would block it from going to a laser. Uh, but instead, you can pick it up and send it to a detector. And we did ranging measurements for up to 60 meters using this. Um, it, it's not really limited to 60 meters. That's what we could do in the lab. It could work for larger distances. But again, it's very simple and uh, just extra thing that you can do in the same lithography step on the silicon chip. So input um, insertion loss for this element is 0.17 dB, much smaller than for some other electro-optic modulator solutions. It's fully passive, so no energy consumption at all. Um, it's smaller footprint than other solutions, including electro-optic modulators and lithium niobate and so on. Um, and also speed is uh, um, very high, right? Much higher than for, for some of the other uh, modulators or MEMS type structures. So that, those were the, no, that was one new functionality that I wanted to emphasize. And here is another one. Uh, this is on-chip uh, integrated laser driven particle accelerator. So that's um, not, we normally in photonics don't think about uh, particle accelerators, right? I mean, particle accelerators are uh, relying on radio frequency waves and microwaves. And um, of course, these are, these are structures that occupy uh, large um, areas. They're, they are miles or many miles long, depending on how much you would like to accelerate particles. And the way they work is you have all of these stages of acceleration where you employ microwaves uh, in order to accelerate charged particles and then in the next stage you accelerate them more and more until we reach the energies for uh, some medical applications or imaging or maybe high energy physics experiments. So at Stanford, for example, we have 
Stanford Linear Accelerator. Some of you probably know it. It's on the hills above Stanford. It's three miles long and uh, it's heavily booked mm, year round for a variety of experiments because also free electron la laser that uh, um, uh, is uh, implemented there. Uh, but again, it occupies a lot of area and uh, footprint and people have to come here from all over the world in order to do those experiments. But if you go, you know, take a simple scaling argument, you know, you think, okay, radio frequency waves that people are using for acceleration in those accelerators have, are 10, 000, have 10,000 uh, times larger wavelength than infrared waves that we use in our uh, experiments, then in principle, you could shrink those accelerators by a factor of 10,000 just by replacing um, uh, these radio frequency or mi microwaves that you're using for acceleration with infrared light. Uh, and uh, in that case, something like Slack, Stanford Linear Accelerator would shrink from three miles to a few inches of a wafer, right? Which is uh, then opening a lot of opportunities because these accelerators, portable accelerators could be shipped to people and they could be used in their labs instead of them coming from all over the world to just specific accelerator to do experiments. And also it's more portable for radiation therapy in medicine and so on. So how do you do that? Of course, you can't just shrink all the components in an accelerator by a factor of 10,000. It wouldn't work, right? Because microwave or radio frequency elements are very different from what we do in optics. But at the same time, in optics, we don't really have solutions for, for this particular problem because we've never really worked on that. Um, so how do we do that? Um, well, we decided to, again, rely on inverse design to design the full stage of accelerator. And that stage of accelerator is shown here. This element here, this is the fabricated structure, is basically um, the structure that shapes input laser field in such a way that it would be always in phase with the incoming electron. So we shoot electrons from converted electron beam microscope. Uh, they have 83.4 kilo electron volt energy. And this is, of course, designed for that energy and it's a single stage. Electron would go through this vacuum channel here uh, and interact with the electromagnetic field and field is designed and structure is designed in such a way that field always provides the kick, never decelerates electrons, it always accelerates them. And um, again, this is in vacuum um, and this structure is made in silicon. And he, here we use two micron um, uh, operating wavelength, femtosecond laser, 300 femtosecond pulse laser, which we couple to the structure. So it's not just the design of the vacuum waveguide, right? You also have to design couplers because this is a very broadband coupler for high energy laser pulses. And we also use the design for that. So we couple laser pulses, guide them to the structure. And then here they couple to that particular mode that would accelerate electrons. And here is the, the other angled image of that stage. And of course, this is just a single stage, 30 micrometers long. But as you'll see here, we were able to achieve 30 mega electron volt per meter acceleration gradient, uh, which tells you that if you cascade 100 or 1,000 of these stages, you'll go to mega electron volts from 83 kilo electron volts. And you'll already get to the range of energies that are useful for material science and for medicine. And that's what we're doing now. We're cascading a lot of stages together. So here is, here is now the experiment, right? So you have the fabricated structures. And here, um, when you have no laser on at the input, you measure, you, you turn on your electron beam and your electron beam exits this structure with the same energy that it had at the input, 83.4 uh, kilo electron volts. When you turn the laser on, you accelerate electrons and you accelerate them by about a kilo electron volt in three 30 micrometers. So if you calculate gradient, it's one kilo electron volt per 30 micrometers. So that's 30 mega electron volts per meter. And of course, single stage doesn't do much even in traditional accelerator, but cascading them would do a lot. And you know, cascading sufficient number of elements, hundred or thousand of them, again, would bring you to mega electron volts and relativistic electrons that are interesting for radiation therapy and for, for imaging. And that's only about an inch of your silicon wafer. So that's what we're doing now in, in collaboration with foundries, because again, this is not something that we want to fabricate at Stanford as opposed to our early work, uh, but we're very enthusiastic about this and, and the prospects of that. Um, so now let me shift gears um, and spend the, the final 15 minutes or so uh, saying a few words about the quantum side of our work. And um, um, again, there, this is 
about half of my group works on quantum optics and quantum photonics, but uh, the common theme is again photonics, right? And um, um, we, we are just using it for a different set of applications in quantum technologies. And I think all of you are familiar with the recent excitement regarding quantum technologies and breakthroughs in superconducting quantum systems, uh, such as the one shown here from IBM. Uh, there are several dozens of qubits uh, that people uh, have managed to successfully fabricate in these dilution refrigerators and use them for some interesting problems. Um, and then also in atomic physics systems, people can build simulators consisting of a few hundreds of atoms. And he, we, in my team uh, at Stanford, are working on semiconductor platforms, core centers in diamond and silicon carbide, which are really uh, naturally trapped atoms uh, or ions inside of a semiconductor. And we, we are hoping that with a small chip, we could actually replace uh, pretty much these other uh, beautiful experiments that people have done in superconducting systems or atomic physics. Of course, it's not just a chip, right? There is still infrastructure, lasers, craftstats, and so on, but much simpler than for both superconducting systems and for um, also atomic physics systems. So we are primarily focusing on, on impurities in diamond and in silicon carbide. And these are some of the structures that we make. And these are types of impurities. This is uh, thin vacancy, for example, in diamond. Um, and I'll tell you more in a moment uh, about the, the choice of qubit and also choice uh, how we make photonics. But I'd like to use this slide to say that it's not just the qubit, right? I mean, it's the same thing in superconducting circuits. Of course, you have to make qubits really good and you know interface them to the environment, but then you also have to connect them efficiently. And that's where photonics plays a really important role. So uh, choice of qubits for us is an optically interfaced semiconductor spin qubit. Right. So then um, that's basically spin of an electron, in, which is um, bound to that impurity in semiconductor and which has an excellent optical interface. So that's the qubit for, for what we're pursuing. But of course, we're interfacing it optically. And photon could be used as a, what people call flying qubit to interconnect to different nodes in the quantum network or, or quantum computer or quantum simulator. And if you're looking at the physics of what we do, it's exactly the same as superconducting qubit in a microwave cavity. So your equations that govern behavior of a Josephson junction, uh, superconducting qubit in some microwave resonator are exactly the same as the equations that govern the behavior of this color center impurity inside of a cavity in diamond or silicon carbide. In this case, for example, we have a thin vacancy in diamond, which is two missing carbon atoms in diamond and an extra thin atom in between. But it could be silicon. That's another option or, or something else. So what are the differences, right? If equations are the same, what are the differences? Well, first, these superconducting systems are large. Uh, you know, they operate at microwave frequencies. People can make everything using traditional lithography. And it's easier to make them all the same, right? For us, everything is smaller by a factor of 1,000. We work at visible valent or near infrared. Qubit for us is a single impurity inside of a block of semiconductor as opposed to this lithographically defined Josephson junction. So it's much harder, of course, to make everything here and controllably put these qubits at the desired positions and, and make structures because everything is smaller. You have to rely on sophisticated nanofabrication techniques. But there are advantages once you succeed, right? First, you work with semiconductors. Silicon carbide is a pretty common silicon semiconductor as opposed to superconductors. You can operate at higher temperatures. Some things work at room temperature, but of course, everything works better when you cool it down. But you don't really need to cool it down to millikelvin temperatures. It works at few Kelvin temperature, which is a big difference because you use very different equipment. You don't use dilution refrigerator. For any of our experiments, you use closed cycle cryostats that are much more portable. So if you're making a quantum network, you don't need to put dilution refrigerator every few kilometers or, or uh, something like that. You can just put some portable closed cycle cryostat. Also, you have excellent optical interface. These are optical interface spin qubits, as opposed to microwave interface only for, for superconducting qubits. That means that you don't need quantum transducers from microwave to optical photons. You can directly connect to these qubits using optical networks. Maybe you need to convert frequency to reduce loss, but you will just work with optical photons. And that's a, a big deal because you know state of the art uh, a connection between superconducting systems is beautiful work by Andreas Wolraff at ETH in um, in Zurich, where you they used cryogenically cooled superconducting line. 
to connect to kind of superconducting quantum computers. And that was 20 meters long, and they're extending it to 40 meters. But of course, it, it would never be able to go to something much longer than that, because it's cryogenically cooled and superconducting. And finally, and maybe most importantly, the number of two qubit gate operations per electron spin coherence time that you have in the systems that we're working with is actually larger than for superconducting qubits. So when you scale everything up, you can actually do uh, larger depth quantum circuits using these systems. System preserves coherence for a longer time relative to the operation time. But of course, we, because of all of the difficulties and novel mm, fabrication methods, we haven't really scaled it to the level that the superconducting systems are at. But when we do, this would be very beneficial. So now, you know, just let me give you some, some um, uh, up, updates on where we stand in terms of that. Uh, again, in Diamond, we primarily work with silicon and tin vacancies. Um, and uh, silicon vacancies have been coupled um, efficiently to diamond cavities. Uh, this is from our work. People have already demonstrated excellent photonic interfaces. There was a related work at Harvard uh, as well. So that, that works quite, quite nicely. Um, then also for tin vacancies, this is a much more recently kind of developed and discovered color center. Uh, we and also MIT and, and Cambridge in collaboration have demonstrated um, that it really performs uh, as we expect and that it should perform the same as silicon vacancy, but at a higher temperature. So the reality is that for silicon vacancy, you still need to use the dilution refrigerator and merely Kelvin temperatures. But tin vacancy works the same as silicon vacancy, and you can use closed cycle crafts that and work at few Kelvin temperature, which again experimentally makes a difference. And then also recently, in collaboration with Zia Chen and Ingmar Lush at Stanford, we've developed a method which we call a shallow ion implantation and subsequent diamond overgrowth, which allows us to make a selective arrays of uh, tin vacancy color centers, regular arrays, with very high quality. So uh, the problem with making these uh, color centers is that generally, you know, people have to use high energy bombardment with ions of tin or silicon. Uh, and, and when you bombard diamond with these high energy ions, you are also deforming crystalline lattice of uh, diamond, which changes the, the environment for these color centers. And your qubits are not all the same. They're affected by that environment. So that's not really desirable. What we've shown is that we can actually do the same at much lower energies. Uh, one kilo electron volt instead of 370 kilo electron volts, which is typically used, which makes much, much higher quality color centers and also allows us to mask the chip and actually insert them at the desired places because mask can survive this low energy implantation. Of course, at the end, you end up with color centers that are near surface. So you have to finish everything with CVD growth of, of high purity diamond, but the resulting structures have much, much nicer properties. And we also work with silicon carbide color centers, uh, silicon vacancies in silicon carbide, which is just a missing atom in 4H polytype of silicon carbide. Um, and these color centers are also having very stable transitions over long time scales, hours, and they're in the near infrared range. Um, they're basically um, nearly Fourier transform limited. Uh, long electron spin coherence times, 20 milliseconds, indistinguishable photons generated. And um, this is all actually very exciting for, for building scalable systems. So for um, just going back to scaling of the systems, right? So we do have high quality qubits. So why didn't we scale it to the same range as superconducting systems? And the problem is in inhomogeneities, right? Which are much harder to control here than in superconducting systems where everything is lithographically defined. So here, uh, even if you look at these regular arrays, there are some empty spots. Those are spatial inhomogeneities, but that's something that we can control. But then there are also spectral inhomogeneities, which are uh, coming from imperfect lattice around your, your core center. And even if we do really well, we still have about 30 gigahertz spectral broadening, um, in, in homogeneous broadening for, for example, here, silicon vacancy color centers. And that's what kind of has slowed down uh, the development or scaling of these systems, which is why our team and many other teams have spent years trying to figure out how to overcome these inhomogeneous broadenings. So for Diamond, we recently, a few years back, came up with a tuning method where we've shown that by 
doing off-resonant driving uh, using off-resonant laser on each color center, we can uh, tune the frequency of the scattered photon by up to 100 gigahertz, which is three times or more larger than in homogeneous broadening, which means that simply just by driving each color center with an off-resonant laser and tuning the frequency of that laser, you can compensate for all of the inhomogeneities in the system. Um, and then also for silicon carbide, we've recently shown that we can do the same uh, with microwave um, tuning. Uh, this is start shifting uh, because they have the first order DC start shift. And in the process, uh, we can tune it by about 200 gigahertz without any degradation on the, on the transitions of the car center. So this can compensate for all of the broadenings. But again, you can say, well, you know, but you need separate laser to tune each, each qubit, or you need a separate set of electrodes to tune each qubit. In reality, in superconducting systems, people also tune each qubit separately. But I'll show you later on the methods that allow you to get rid of most of this. For example, to have only one set of electrodes for 10 qubits. So uh, apart from, from DC tuning, you can also do AC tuning, right? Microwave tuning of the color center. And recently we've shown that by, by tuning it with the speeds in silicon carbide in this case, uh, with the, that are uh, faster than the decay rate of the color center, we can kind of completely control the spectrum of the qubit at the output, right? So these are some experimental results, but that there are also theoretical results here which show that by changing the spectrum of the microwave drive, you can change the spectrum of your color center at the output. And instead of just having these two simple lines at the output, you can have multiple lines, you can kind of have an asymmetric spectrum, whatever you desire. And you can even run some optimization methods on what type of microwave drive you would like to have in order to produce particular spectrum at the output. Um, and we've shown experimentally that this indeed works. So these are experimental results on configurable spectrum, reconfigurable spectrum of the silicon vacancy color center. But the reason why I'm mentioning this and why this is important is because it gives you another knob to turn. If you have your uh, different color centers that are broadened and have different transition frequencies, you can run these optimized microwave signals on all of them and produce spectra that are interacting together. And as I'll show you later, we've recently shown that you can even put the same set of electrodes and optimized drive and make them talk to each other, even though they do not really talk before, before you apply some, some optimized microwave field. Again, to build quantum systems, it's not just qubits, right? You also need photonics and connections. And everything that we're talking about today in quantum technologies, quantum repeaters and networks, quantum simulators, computers, they're all different flavors of the same thing, right? If you have um, homogeneous long-lived qubits with good optical interfaces, and if you have efficient optical connections, you can implement any of these. And uh, I talked about homogeneous qubits, uh, now for optical connections, we do the same using photonics. And I spent the first part of the talk talking about how to optimize photonics. Uh, but you can, of course, do the same in diamond or silicon carbide. So here are optimized diamond devices, uh, diamond circuits for quantum technologies. And this is fabricated by three-dimensional bulk carving of diamond. And you see non-intuitive shapes that are results of optimization. And they dramatically improve the properties of the experiment. I mean, when you use an optimized coupler, even to a single resonator, you can increase experimentally uh, your um, uh, counts by a factor of 500, reduce experimental time by a factor of 500, and easier to scale the system between multiple nodes, so that without any degradation in the, the photonics elements. Um, and you can, of course, still have your color centers coupled to these optimized photonics without degradation of the properties of the color center in qubit. We do the same in silicon carbide. And I just like to spend a moment to say that silicon carbide, apart from quantum technologies, I think is a very exciting photonics material. Um, because no other material, including silicon on insulator or tin film lithium niobate, has all the features that silicon carbide has. Silicon carbide hosts high quality quantum emitters, high quality qubits. It's available on wafer scale, six inch wafers. It's, it's silicon compatible. It's pretty much the same pro fabrication process as silicon. It has large band gap, excellent thermal conductivity, piezoelectric, and strong second order optical nonlinearity. No other material has that. Linear nibate has good non second order optical nonlinearity, but no good quantum emitters, right? And uh, in, we, this is the reason why we're very excited about silicon carbide for quantum technologies and other classical photonics technologies. 
But of course, uh, we didn't really have a commercially available thin film silicon carbide and insulator to make photonics, which is why we had to make it ourselves. Um, and the process that we use is just thinning and bonding. Um, and we can fabricate high uniformity chips that we can use for, for our applications. But this is scalable to wafer scale as well. Uh, so what once you make that thin film silicon carbide, you can make high quality photonics. And at the moment, we have quality factors in uh, at 1.5 micron greater than 5 million. So this is, again, material that we make at Stanford. And we fabricate everything at Stanford. And loss is 0.08 dB per centimeter. So these numbers are comparable to foundry-based silicon nitride systems. This is our first result on second harmonic generation. This is already from about like a year and a half ago where we had efficiency of 360% per watt. But right now, we're in process of confirming that the efficiency is 36,000% per watt because we have much higher Q factors and better fabrication now. And these numbers are comparable to lithium nanobit uh, nonlinear optics. Uh, recently, also, we demonstrated in collaboration with Marty Fair's group at Stanford uh, optical parametric oscillation in the silicon carbide resonators with 8 milliwatt thresholds. And uh, even more recently, we demonstrated also soliton frequency comb uh, in silicon carbide. Uh, once we improved Q factors, we were able to make soliton frequency comb with 2 milliwatts power. And of course, apart from quantum optics, uh, frequency combs in certain material are interesting, very interesting for metrology and for sensing. Uh, same with optical parametric oscillators, but they could also be interesting for generation of variety of interesting uh, non uh, quantum states of light. And uh, we have very high Q factors at the uh, infrared valence, 1.5, uh, about 5 million or more. And also at the, the visible valence, we have Q factors of around half a million. Um, so that number is probably also could be improved a little bit more beyond that. And finally, with all of that, we also have high quality qubits that are not really degraded once you make photonics around them. So you can actually make excellent photonic interfaces. So now going forward, just the outlook for what we do, we're actually very optimistic that we can make on-chip quantum networks and simulators using these systems. And there will be arrays of these color centers inside of silicon carbide structures. They're controlled by electrodes, right? And uh, also optically interface from the outside. Um, there is one kind of simple thing that we could do, which is independently controlling each qubit, which is what people are really doing right now, also in superconducting systems. But there is another thing that we're actively pursuing, which shows that we don't really need to do that. And this is what we refer to as quantum inverse design. We're developing kind of equivalent of photonics inverse design for quantum systems. While in photonics inverse design, we have an electromagnetic simulator, which is coupled with optimizer, and that searches the full parameter space to find photonics device for a particular application. In quantum de inverse design, we have open quantum system simulator coupled with optimizer, same type of optimizer. This is just gradient descent type thing. And that searches through all of parameter space of, of drives for a quantum system or geometries for a quantum system to achieve particular Hamiltonian. And we already have some very exciting results that tell you that this is very promising. For example, here, for simple quantum transduction problem, uh, which where you are converting microwave to optical signal to interface quantum computers, superconducting quantum computers via optical network, generally the favor of centers or ions or atoms, uh, typically in solids, and then drive them with microwave signals and optical signals and use that to convert microwave to optical signal. But because of incomogeneities in atoms or ions, these transduction efficiencies are typically, in state-of-the-art experiments, 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6. That's the state-of-the-art results from, for example, Andre Farron's group at Caltech using rare earth ions in YBO. Um, we have shown that just by applying the optimized optical drive or microwave drive on the whole ensemble, we can reduce homogeneities. And this is optimized drive that we find by applying this quantum inverse design optimization techniques by knowing this inhomogeneous broadening in the ensemble. And as a result of that, we can increase the efficiency by a factor of 20 already. So that's for the ensemble of 10 atoms and very modest parameters. So that's exactly what we're doing now and moving these methods beyond quantum transduction problems, of course, applying it in the context of scaling and implementing on-chip quantum simulators and quantum, quantum networks and also uh, quantum, quantum computers. 
So to summarize, uh, we are uh, confident that first photonics optimization is crucial for building scalable classical and quantum photonic systems. Uh, we have our uh, SPINS, Stanford Inverse Design Software Suite, which is available for licensing from Stanford for a full suite, but then also basic version, which you can download for, for free and open source. It's fully open source on GitHub. Uh, and we've shown this um, power of inverse design by uh, basically developing traditional elements that are um, having a much better behavior on many uh, figures of merit relative to traditional photonics. Uh, but we've also developed new functionalities such as laser driven on chip particle accelerator or optical ranging measurement um, uh, on a silicon chip. Um, we've also shown that this is fully compatible with foundries. Uh, we worked with pretty much all of the major foundries. And finally, it's also applicable, heavily applicable to quantum systems because in quantum systems, losses are even um, uh, more um, harmful than in classical systems where sometimes you can tolerate 50% efficiencies that's absolutely not allowed in quantum systems. So inverse design is very important for quantum systems as well. And uh, in, for implementation of quantum technologies, we're pursuing silicon carbide and diamond color center platform. And finally, um, let me finish by um, thanking our uh, support uh, funding and also uh, showing um, my team that has done the experiments that I presented today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that great talk. And who Thank would you. like to go first in terms of questions? You want to go first? Yes, sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll start. So you you were saying that you, you could also get reasonably high Q and visible yeah. wavelengths. Uh, are you able to get visible lasers on chip? Uh, well, we have done frequency conversion, right? So we're not really using color centers here uh, as a gain medium, but we're actually using second order nonlinearity of the material to convert uh, from 1.5 to uh, 750 in this case. But oh. you can actually do other wavelengths because the band gap of silicon carbide is pretty large. So you can go all the way to blue, uh, right, if you're interested. And uh, uh, currently, Currently, uh, our visible wavelength Q factor is around half a million. Um, I'm sure that that could be also so better because we already have in the infrared around five, five million. Uh, but with, with those range of Q factors, we are already in terms of second harmonic generation efficiencies, we should be comparable to thin film lithium nabit. So that's, uh, that's actually a very exciting part, right? And also photonics is uh, already having very high quality in the infrared range and silicon carbide as a material is much easier to process than lithium niobate. So on the nonlinear optics applications, um, it's, uh, it's a very exciting material. And uh, of course, apart from that, it's also very exciting for quantum technologies. I've got a question, um, a yeah. great talk. Um, Thank you, Tom. yeah, thanks. Um, so, and I'm sure you must have been asked this many times. So, with your with your uh, inverse design, uh, I was intrigued when you said you know you found six solutions for the yeah. that one uh, multiplexer. So, you know that suggests that it can uh, get into local minima uh, or ma maxima, whatever you want to say. Yeah. And, and so, how do you uh, how do you and maybe in general terms, how do you nudge it to explore the whole space and and make sure you're really finding optimum yeah. solutions? Yeah, so the, the answer to that question is, uh, this is of course local optimization, right? So you uh, generally, if you find a good local optimum, you don't care if it's a global optimum or not, right? In, in, as, as from the perspective of practical applications, right? So we normally don't search, once we find a good, good local optimum, we stop. And if it satisfies our constrained uh, uh, criteria for whatever fabrication and performance and efficiency, that's fine, right? Um, for certain range of problems, we explored the full parameter space with different initializations. We studied all the solutions and the paper review paper we recently published in Applied Physics Reviews shows, for example, the picture of the full parameter space for one particular problem and clusters of solutions. And, and they're kind of equally good solutions, right? And, and there are a lot of solutions that are not so good around them, uh, but we kind of charted the full parameter space for some specific problems. Um, and we also uh, are collaborating with Stephen Boyd, who is an optimization expert in, um, uh, in electrical engineering at Stanford on looking how far we are from global optima. 
So, so that's what we refer to as bounds on inverse design problems. And for, for some of the problems that we solved, we actually have mathematical proof that we're uh, pretty close to the global optimum for, for those problems. Of course, this is a work in progress and we can't really generalize it to every problem. We can also apply it to problems where uh, that we define in a certain way and for which the math applies. But that was actually very surprising finding that you know, using optimization techniques uh, for a certain set of problems, you are guaranteed to be pretty close to the global optimum once you apply certain optimization routines and once you initialize in a certain way. So that's um, the answer for, to the question, right? So it depends really uh, if you are applied mathematician and interested really if you are in a global optimum, uh, you were, we actually are doing work kind of proving how, how far we are from global optima or how we need to initialize to, to potentially get closer to it. But from the just user perspective, uh, local optimum is totally fine if it satisfies whatever criteria you, you, you make. And the more you constrain the problem, of course, the fewer solutions would be, right? If there are six solutions for 90% efficiency, for 99% efficiency, right? Uh, uh, usually there are not so many. Uh, it's, it's interesting because it's like, uh you know, with uh, something like the Shannon limit, you, you know, we know what the target is and then yeah. we know how close we are. But in some of these problems, we don't really know uh, yeah. how, how good it could be other, other than perfect. I yeah, guess. It, is, it is actually a really interesting uh, theory problem, which is why we're collaborating with applied mathematicians, right? I mean, Stephen Boyd is an applied mathematician and optim optimization expert uh, to exactly answer that question. Because for most of these problems, we actually don't really know what the limit is. And for example, if you're designing, uh, wavelength splitter, you start from some footprint, but you don't really know in advance if you can find 90% efficient solution in a three micron footprint, right? So, so, so what is the minimum footprint for a particular function? And people have looked into this and we've also looked into it. And, you know, David Miller, for example, from Stanford has looked into bounds, but those are not very strict bounds, right? I mean, they just tells you it needs to be, footprint needs to be smaller than something, or we have some intuition on how big the footprint is, but we want to find tighter bounds because it's also very important for the optimization. You don't want to start from two micron footprint and, and kind of run, run optimization and realize there is no solution, right? You want to be more guided in the process in terms of initializing and, and also uh, in terms of kind of determining the footprint of the device. But having that said, um, I think what helps is that we have developed this very high speed optimization tool. So, so the whole optimization process for the structure behind me takes a couple of hours on gaming GPUs. So this is not a supercomputer. This is what kind of pretty much every desktop can have, costs one to $2,000. So if it takes few hours, right, then you follow the process. If you see you are not converging, you can easily re restart the process after an hour. You are not wasting time. It's not like you're waiting like two months to realize that your problem doesn't have a solution. And hopefully going forward, we'll know more about actual bounds on the design. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. In um, your laser driven uh, particle accelerators, um, yeah. are the particles moving along a straight line or are they moving in a helical fashion? And They're moving along the straight line, right? So yes. is the electric field driving them and what does the magnetic field do in that case? Uh, are you talking about the AC? Uh, this is a, a interaction with the electric field. Yes, for the acceleration itself, we're designing electric field profile. So the interaction is actually happening between the electric field and the charged particle. So it's the electric field of the light yeah. that's driving the yes. light. And the yes, magnetic exactly. field does not uh, wiggle the particles. Yeah, it's, in this particular case, for these structures, actually, there is no magnetic field along the trajectory of the particle because it said the node would be a, pretty much at the node of the magnetic field because it's a maximum of the electric field inside of the structure. So it's kind of like a photonic crystal structure where along the direction of propagation, you, you are having electric field. Yeah, but if you have a, if the yeah. electron is moving at some velocity and the magnetic yeah. field is perpendicular to it, Lorentz force is going to give it a helical motion. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely, yes. But in this particular case, there is no effect of the, I completely agree with you, right? But in this particular case, there is no really effect of the magnetic field on the problem. Um, I think you could certainly design it to take that into account. And uh, I believe in this case, the magnetic field component would be, well, there would be some small component in the perpendicular direction, definitely, but, but it would not really have uh, an effect on the propagation. Okay. Because we do see them, we do not really see uh, like a large broadened spot on the target, right? When we turn on, we just see, I, I mean, this, uh, we 
we have uh, kind of we perform mass, not mass spectroscopy, but we separate electrons with different velocities, right, on the target. But we do not really have a broadening coming from some cyclotron orbit resulting from the magnetic field. But it is actually also possible that this would be more visible on the larger trajectories because you only have 30 micrometers of interaction in this particular case. It's just a single stage of acceleration, right? So, so I agree with you that you probably need to worry about it more than as you go to much larger distances. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Yelena. Uh, this is Zhe uh, Thank you. Oh, hi, Zhe Shen. Nice to hi. see you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, very impressive talk with so many thank great you. stuff. Uh, so I actually have a question about uh, uh, silicon carbide uh, yeah. quantum photonics. So, so uh, it is uh, achieving, uh, for example, high, uh, strong coupling one of your goals, and uh, yeah. uh, uh, and what are what are the major challenges? Uh, Based Definitely, on. yes. So, so we are actually working on that because once you get to the strong coupling regime, a lot of opportunities are open, right? And you know, so far, I mean, the really the in terms of strong coupling and cavity fluid experiments in solid state, the kind of state of the art experiments are still experiments we and others did on uh, indium marsonite, gallium marsonite quantum dots, right? But those are systems are not really scalable because of the inhomogeneous broadening. So with color centers. The reason why we're working on color centers is kind of they're more uniform as you go from one color center to another. But then there are issues with uh, non radiative uh, uh, decay and efficiencies, internal efficiencies, and some of the color line bits of the color centers are not as narrow as they are for quantum dots. Mm -hmm. so, so we do think that we can actually reach the strong coupling regime. Uh, we're not there yet and nobody has demonstrated it yet. Um, the problem is that in the experiments that we did so far, we didn't use the highest quality quantum emitters. All right? So we actually used the material from Crete, commercial material. And we did generate silicon vacancies color centers by proton irradiation, basically. It's just kicking out silicon vacancies. And that didn't really result in the highest quality color centers. So now we're collaborating um, with uh, team, um, um, teams in, in Germany and Sweden on growth. Um, I mean, first of high, qual high quality material in the right type of cut so that color centers can in-plane polarization. So they couple to electric field. That was one of the problems in the previous work. And uh, then that material would be kind of thinned down and uh, made uh, as silicon carbide on insulator. And once we do that, and you know we have these high quality emitters with the right dipole polarization in the resonators, which is implant polarization, I think we should be able to see strong coupling. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. not the case. So the experiments that I showed with kind of large enhancement, um, um, those were so-called B1 prime um, uh, transitions in silicon vacancy in silicon carbide that are in plane polarized, but they are known not to be very good. And then V2 is TM polarized, right? So in that case, so if you start from a different cut of material, then your V2 line would be in plane polarized and coupled to the cavity, and then you can have strong coupling. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you and did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question also about the um, the accelerator, the electron yeah, accelerator. Yeah, sure, yeah. So uh, I noticed that when you were plotting the distributions, it looked like the, the distribution of electron velocities changed yeah. a lot between before and after. And I was wondering what caused the, the, the distribution shape to change in addition to just a shift that you would expect. Yes, yeah. So we're actually, we did a lot of, um, um, I, I could actually go to that uh, that slide just to, to show it. Uh, the paper itself, which we published in Science about a year ago, has a detailed analysis of everything that, it, that is going on there. But the short answer to that question is that in this particular experiment, we didn't really bunch the electrons. We generate them with 300 femtosecond laser cycle, uh, uh, laser pulses from the tip, right? So they are not really bunched and they're not I, I'm exactly uh, synchronized with the electric field uh, of the structure. I mean, they're synchronized up to a certain level, but not completely, which is why uh, when you're looking at the experimental results here, um, that I'll just show again one, once here it is, right? So you, you also have these lobes of de decelerated electrons on the other side, which are entering the structure out of phase with the field. And they're kind of always decelerated by the same amount. And then between the ones that are maximum, going through maximum acceleration and the ones that are going through maximum deceleration, there is a spread of the ones that are kind of entering the stru structure at different instants of time. Of course, this is not a problem that will exist in a practical accelerator because there is there are people developing bunchers, right? Electron bunching structures. 
So that would all be uh, resolved once you build a practical system. But for the purpose of the experiment, we didn't really worry about it. We just looked at the, the whole um, distribution of electrons and then um, effect on the structure. And that really agrees with how you would expect it to, to behave. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have other questions? Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to um, ask something if I could. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems like in a lot of cases you start off with this kind of box um, and a, a binary mask, which works really well for fabrication. Uh, but are there any kind of like other types of devices or initial setups that you optimize? And kind of along with that, like what are you optimizing in the quantum case uh, since you don't have this um, mask structure? Yeah, so we do, uh, we just start from kind of box, black box and some random distribution of pixels in the black box uh, in most cases. But, you know, now we have some better ways to initialize the problem. But it is a black box that you are, you are really optimizing in the process and updating as you are going, performing adjoint optimization or, or some kind of optimization. Um, uh, it's typically a single single layer of something that we're optimizing so that you perform one layer of lithography. More recently, we've designed also two layer structures and some of the foundries have the ability to do two layers that are aligned to each other. And of course, in that case, you have higher, larger parameter space and you can design it for higher efficiency and so on. So those would be two interleaved patterns in two layers. So we are designing that as well and you know, in silicon on insulator or some other materials. And then in, in uh, quantum devices, it's still technically a box, right? So this is a suspended structure. What you see, for example, here, this is a gradient coupler, which we design as a box, but input is from above and output is in plane, right? So your inputs and outputs can be anywhere in that box. And then this here is basically like a beam splitter, right? Where it's, you split input power into two output ports. So this was also designed as a box, but with different fabrication constraints because in diamond feature sizes that we can fabricate are generally not as small as the ones we can make in silicon. So it's like minimum feature sizes of 100 nanometers and so on. And then at the output, you have the same elements or you know, here in silicon carbide, you, for example, have some optimized, it's hard to see here, uh, there, but in the paper, it's easier to see that these are inverse design couplers for a particular input spot. And then we often also design coupling elements. Of course, this is just a regular ring because we're using rings uh, because of Q, higher Q for, for nonlinear optics, but we're designing uh, coupling elements, we're designing couplers, uh, we can replace beam splitters, all of the connections, right? There are a lot of elements in quantum that you also need. Uh, you could replace beam splitters, you could replace uh, uh, couplers and, and a lot of interfaces. Of course, in, in quantum, you know, often people ask a question about the resonator, right? Because there are a lot of resonators that we need uh, for, uh, and Jeshen was asking about it, right? For cavity QED. And 10 years ago, actually, one of the first papers on inverse design that we published was inverse design of a resonator. And although you can, in principle, improve Q over B, you know, resonators are structures that have a relatively small parameter space. And by brute forcing that parameter space, people have already designed really good resonators. So going, you know, uh, they're already absorption limited and up uh, at this point, they cannot really be improved anymore that there is really no reason to inverse design resonator itself. But I see a, a lot of point in inverse designing interface of that resonator to a waveguide or inverse designing a resonator in such a way that you clear out certain region for your color centers or make field immune to misalignment of color centers and practical problems that we often face in quantum, quantum technologies. So for those, um, for, for like what you talked about right at the end of the inverse, of, in, inverse design of quantum systems, uh, like the, oh, I'm, for that one, yeah, yeah. That yeah. one, what, what's, what's being optimized? Oh there? yeah, so yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, I didn't understand that you're talking about uh, this particular pro problem. Uh, in this particular case, you are optimizing both uh, permittivity of the structure. And of course, you know, you can reduce that and use the traditional inverse design for that. But what we are also optimizing is driving on the structure, right? So all pulse sequences or global drive on the structure. So in the transduction problem, uh, and we posted this on archive, uh, um, uh, last week, so you can actually read it, read this particular paper on the archive. We're actually optimizing global drive on ensemble of color centers to optimize transduction efficiency. So this could be optical drive, 
or it could be also microwave drive, right? It doesn't matter, but it's a global drive, right? Oh, okay. And then that, that would then need to be gen like created, like the optimized drive would then need exactly. to be generated. Exactly. So what okay. that does is that basically recovers super radiance in the system and makes uh, a color centers talk together uh, to each other, despite the fact that they're, have different transitions realistically different transitions, which is of course a very big problem. So if you can overcome that just by one set of electrodes, then you can much easier scale your quantum system. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So do we have other questions? If not, I can like to transition to, oh, Masid. What's your maximum solver? You said that it's faster than the uh, conventional ones. Are you using FDTD or is it something? No, uh, no we're not using FDTD. We are using finite difference frequency domain solver. Um, that one is open source and available online. And we recently, I mean, we, we wrote it. Um, uh, that is basically eigenmode solver, right? So you represent your Maxwell's equations or your eigenvalue equation as a um, um, linear algebra problem, right? And then you use numerical methods to basically solve that problem and kind of numerically invert the matrix. And for problems, uh, three, up to three, three, dimensional, three dimensional problems with up to 10 micrometer in linear dimension for, for basically, let's say, optical uh, research, right? So which means something like 10 valence or 20 valence, right? Uh, in three dimensions, that works much better than finite difference time domain. It's much solver, uh, much faster. If you go to larger structures, you know, because of the ill-conditioned matrices and problems with numerical solution of the um, uh, in, numerical inversion of the matrix, at some point, finite difference time domain, you know, for very large structure would become better or faster. Uh, but even finite difference time domain blows up. So we we are actually working on better types of solvers uh, for very large optics problems. For example, meta surfaces that are hundreds of micrometers in, in uh, dimension. And what, what I see as the future of inverse design is that depending on the problem, you will perform the optimization in the same way, but you will switch between different solvers. So some, for something up to 10 microns, you use FD, FD, frequency domain eigenmode solver. Then you can use time domain solver. And we already interfaced our software to time domain also solver, and it's available also online. And then beyond that, you go to some custom made solvers for specific problems. So the sharp discontinuities in the dielectric function um, between, say, cavity and material medium, it does not. Um, cause any problems in this? Uh, that is actually all, that is all optimized, right? So if you uh, remember the movie that I showed at the beginning, so in the interest of time, I will not go back, but I, I guess this will be posted online. So, so it could be also seen. We go through first phase of optimization where we have binary optimization, uh, sorry, non-binary, uh, where we allow con uh, the electric constant to continuously vary between target values, right? And there, you know, there are no sharp discontinuities. And then from there, we do boundary optimization where we make binary structure, but we spent, we published a few papers and spent a lot of time making sure that we can do that in an efficient way so we don't degrade the device behavior. So with continuous dielectric constant, you can actually optimize anything, but then that cannot be made. So then you, when you go to binary, of course, there are discontinuities, but you have to carefully proceed between first phase and second phase in order not to degrade the device performance. So that's what we call binary optimization. And that uh, transition, uh, we, we wrote, uh, published a paper, uh, the most recent one last year on how we're actually doing that. And the maximum sol solver still works um, fast? Yeah, or, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, you solve electromagnetics of the problem in twice in each step of optimization, right? So, so I, the movie that I was showing, there is no, mm, not, you solve eigenvalue, you know, equation for, for electromagnetics and Maxwell's equations twice in every, every step. Uh, and, you know, of course you can, um, you know, satisfy bad boundary conditions and, you know, you're solving the same Maxwell's equations uh, and, and looking for a solution as you would be solving with any type of solver, right? I mean, the reason why we use frequency domain solver and not time domain is because it's faster for, for these problems. But nothing can be violated here, right? Because you are solving, uh, like you're just simulating something perturbing structure and re-simulating and perturbing and re-simulating. The point of optimization is that that tells you how to perturb the structure to converge towards the optimum, right? Thanks. Thank you.
Do we have other questions? If not, I'd like to transition to the meet and greet, which is basically for students and it's to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and ask a question that's maybe not technically related to the talk, like perhaps sure. yeah. how you became a professor or something. So uh, do we have any students that would like to take this opportunity to turn on the video, say hello? Uh, this is varying degrees of participation depending on how shy people are. So <laughs> if not, I can start with uh, my yeah. traditional icebreaker question. So my, my first one is, like, what is the next big problem you would like to see someone other than yourself work on? Uh, in photonics in or general? In, in, in anything. In anything. Uh, Could be however you want to answer it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think certainly environment-related problems, right? So we have a global crisis there, and uh, there are a lot of <laughs> relevant problems there. And I think in photonics as well, we're solving some problems that are definitely related to environment, right? I was talking about... Uh, uh, interconnects and data centers, and those are very energy and environment related problems uh, because uh, we burn a significant amount of power in data centers, and that's only increasing, right? And I'm sure this pandemic didn't really help in that respect because we're all spending all of our time on Zoom, right? And and networking uh, online. Um, so so certainly. Um, problems related to the environment and energy because there is a these are pressing issues for the planet and we have limited amount of time so in variety of fields starting of course i mean i'm i'm optics researcher but uh, also there are many many relevant problems in in variety of, of fields Great. and then what is the best advice you have for graduate students Oh, best advice I have for graduate students to basically just pick something that they're interested in and passionate, you know, about because, uh, of course, uh, none of us went to grad school to, <laughs> with with the motivation, you know, to to uh, become rich while graduate students. Although occasionally it happens, right? You know, people <laughs> start companies and so on. But you know, we do go to grad school um, generally to um, because we're passionate about doing research, right? And you want you want to have to be a researcher later in, in life, either in academia and solve some important problems. And, you know, of course, grad school is not easy. So it's important to pick problems that are you're passionate about. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's hard to motivate, you know, yourself or, or your, your students to work on something uh, for such a long time. Um, and, and it's a lot of hard work, right? And it requires a lot of sacrifices. So, so really um, uh, picking the right problem uh, is, is uh, the key. And all, uh, apart from that, you know, you, you work in the same lab with, with the, the group and your advisor, it's kind of like a family, right? You spend more time than with your family for those five years. So, so enjoying being part of that team is also very important. Do we have so any students? Sorry? <laughs> or, oh, any, any students, uh, do any students want to introduce themselves? Yeah, don't be shy <laughs> if there are students online. <laughs> yeah, that's another advice, not don't be shy. <laughs> be shy. Okay, I guess they're all very shy today. So I, I guess- They can contact me later by email if they're okay. shy. It's okay, next time. Uh, uh, Masu, did you have another? Question or no? No, no, I'm too shy. <laughs> too shy. <laughs> um, so I, with that, I just thank you again for spending the time and graciously answering all of our questions for so long. And we really yeah. appreciate it. it was such a fantastic talk. So thank you well, so thank much. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure. And thank you for the great uh, questions and for, for listening. And um, hope we all have an opportunity to see each other in person, not too far in the future, right? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye-bye.